Uh, my name is Eric Frierson, and I'm the Director of Field Engineering for EBSCO. And uh, I'm joined by uh, Keith Rocky, the Director of Pima Community College. And I'll let Keith introduce himself a little bit later into the WebEx when we get over to uh, the part where he's going to share his story of curriculum builder at his institution. Um, I would like to introduce myself and my team in a little greater detail here as we jump into this part of the WebEx. Um, uh, I lead a team of uh, discovery service engineers, uh, library services engineers. Our role in the company is to make sure EBSCO Discovery Service integrates with the things that your library is trying to do. Curriculum Builder, um, which is the, the topic of today's WebEx, is one of those tools that we use um, to help your library um, show up in places where you might not expect it to. So with that in mind, I'm going to go ahead and jump into one of these places, which is the digital cl classroom. Um, before I joined the company, maybe about five years ago now, geez, it's been a while, um, I remember that one of the, the struggles that we had was getting faculty members to use a library in their digital classroom spaces. So this might be a Blackboard class. It might be uh, a Canvas course or a desire to learn or Moodle or something like that. Um, it was difficult. We would go out every semester to their training days. So, you know, campus IT would have a, a day where faculty members could come and learn how to use the learning management system. And we'd show up and we'd do a session on where to find persistent links in EDS. And please don't download PDF documents and upload them into your system. Um, we do things like covering copyright issues about using library materials in the classroom. And what we found is that no matter how many times we attended those sessions, um, we would get a lot of library champions, but in the end, it isn't terribly easy to use library materials in these learning management systems. So to give you an example, and I think most of you would probably know, uh, I'm going to encourage you to use the chat box or use the Q&A section here to help answer this question. So let's say you're a faculty member and this is your library search box on your homepage. You as a teacher want to assign your students a couple of articles out of the library's databases. What steps would you have to take to go from getting here, the library search box, to a point where you've actually got a great link in your classroom that your students can follow to get to that reading. And I'll give you a couple of seconds to think through that process and what a faculty member would have to do. Please share the steps that your faculty members would have to take uh, in the chat box if you'd like. Um, and, and that's great. I'm going to give you a couple of seconds to kind of think through that. Because I remember what it was like <laughs> back, at, uh, back before we had a tool like this. All right. I'll give you a couple of seconds. All right, we're getting some good responses coming in. Yep, number one, you've got to find the article on the library's website and then find the persistent link. But thanks, Linda, here's a great example. Uh, but maybe also have to add the easy proxy link. So this link that I've got here up on my screen, if I'm a faculty member sitting on campus somewhere and I go to the library's databases and find a link to an item, there is a high likelihood that your proxy prefix won't be on that URL. So you'll grab that URL, come to Moodle, insert the link, and then students who are off campus trying to access uh, that item will hit a paywall or hit something because the proxy prefix isn't on it. Um, that's also a three-step process, right? You, you're in your course, then you have to leave and go to the library website. Uh, maybe negotiate all the different databases that the library has, find that item. But I tell you what, for those champion faculty members who are comfortable finding a persistent link, sometimes even that doesn't work if the proxy prefix is missing. Then you might have to jump through another hoop of knowing what that proxy prefix is or using some kind of tool to add it before you can finally paste it in here. Another thing that we see faculty members doing to get their article here is they will just download the PDF. They've decided that the persistent link issues are just too much. So what they're going to do is they're going to pull up the PDF document, save it to their desktop, and then upload it into their learning management system. And from a technology perspective, that actually works really well for students. They just click on the document and they're reading the item. But there are quite a few issues with that. Um, so let's jump forward a little bit here. The problem with 
the status quo. The problem with using the tools that come out of the box with databases and discovery systems is that linking is not trivial. As much as I would like to say, but we told you how to make persistent linking, it's not something that faculty members do every day, and it isn't something easy to do. Missing proxy prefixes are an issue. Uh, many, many databases have session-specific URLs. That means even if the proxy prefix was there, there's going to be something in that URL that's going to break that link. So what results is faculty members who use links, or at least try to use links, end up with a very frustrating experience. We also notice that usage statistics will disappear. So let's take that example of the, the faculty member who downloaded the PDF document. Well, when they did that download, your library recorded one full text use of that particular item. However, whenever they upload that document into their learning management system, you never see those statistics unless campus IT is sharing those types of links data with you. But in all likelihood, that's probably not happening. And you're actually failing to capture um, some of the most important use of library materials at our institutions, which is in the learning and teaching process. And then finally, um, we also just have problems with learning management system administrators being very reluctant to add any kind of library functionality into the learning management system. Um, I've kind of watched trends over time, and I don't think this is as big of a barrier as it used to be, but I think it very well uh, could still be a big issue um, on many campuses, is that getting a learning management system administrator to add something from the library into their system is often difficult. So that's where the value of this tool we're about to show comes in. So the value of Curriculum Builder. It eliminates issues with persistent linking by not requiring faculty members to find a special link. It also has nothing to do with URLs in the address bar, and in fact is embedded in the learning management system to begin with. So faculty members should never need to grapple with linking at all if they're using Curriculum Builder. The builder. We also hope that it generates more accurate usage statistics for your library. So the way that Curriculum Builder ends up working is as faculty members select items out of your library's collections to use as readings in their courses, every time a student clicks on one of those readings, that's generating a, a, a link into your licensed copy of that item, generating usage statistics for those things. So in this way, you get a better picture of how your library is being used within the learning management system. I'll talk about statistics in a bit more granularity as we go along, too. And finally, this can be a visible value add for the library uh, using tools that learning management system uh, administrators are very familiar with. Um, I'm going to mention a, 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 an acronym here, and you'll see it on the screen, kind of on the second, second row of that first bullet point is Curriculum Builder is an LTI tool. What LTI stands for is Learning Tools in, oh, hold on, oh crud, this is the part where I forget, right? Learning uh, Tools Interoperability. Uh, it's a standard by which any third party, so a library or a vendor or an individual, people can adhere to this LTI protocol and build a tool that integrates very well with a learning management system. The reason it's powerful as a standard is so many learning management systems have adopted it. I've listed some here, Blackboard, Canvas, Moodle, D2L, Sakai, uh, even K-12-oriented uh, learning management systems like Schoolology and Pearson. Um, there are a number of learning management systems out there that will work with Curriculum Builder because they're LTI compliant. If your item isn't listed here, um, the best thing to do to see if it's a, if Curriculum Builder, what we're about to show you will work, is to Google the name of your learning management system and LTI. And if there's any kind of indication in the results that uh, your learning management system is LTI compliant, then you can use Curriculum Builder as well. Um, in fact, there's really only been maybe like one learning management system I've ever come across that can't use Curriculum Builder. So it's a very widely adopted uh, protocol. So, I do want to do a live demo of this thing to show you what it's like, um, show you a little bit of the administrative features of it, and then after that I'm going to turn it over to Keith who can talk about actual implementation of it at a site and what the reaction to it has been uh, at a particular campus. Um, so let me show you a couple of items here. Um, before I go into the live demo, 
um, I, my live demonstration is in the Canvas learning management system. And I know many of you don't use Canvas, so I wanted to show a couple of screenshots from other learning management systems just to give you a feel of how this tool appears in them. So Blackboard is a very, very popular learning management system here. Um, this is a Blackboard screen. In fact, if any of you are instructors and uh, work in Blackboard as a teacher, uh, Blackboard as a teacher, you'll notice here I'm in the content section of a Blackboard class. And under the tools drop down menu, I have places where I can go to create a discussion board for my students. I can uh, create wikis and have student journals. But there are also places where I can stick curriculum builder in this drop down menu. This particular campus has put it under more tools where you see things like NBC Learn and the calendar and course messages and roster. You'll also see Curriculum Builder here. Um, I want to point out that they named it Library Discovery Curriculum Builder. You can name it whatever you'd like. I've seen some libraries have it listed one search reading list or library reading list, depending on how they've branded EDS at that site. I've also seen some libraries put it under build content instead of the tools drop down menu. So many of these learning management systems have plenty of options of where and how your faculty members are going to find this particular tool. But what happens in Blackboard is if I go to the tools menu and I click on curriculum builder, it's going to launch into the curriculum builder experience, which I'll show you in just a second. In desire to learn, there's a section on adding an activity. And if you add an activity, you'll see all the different activities you can add. So a Wimba voice board or a, a journal, blogs and wikis. This particular campus just called it reading list. Um, and if I click on that, it launches into the curriculum builder experience. And over here on the right, I've got Moodle where I clicked on add an activity for a given week. And I can see all the different things I could potentially give to my students. You'll find curriculum builder under external tool and then you can click on add and launch into that experience. So before we dig into the rest of it, I'm gonna go live. This is the part where everybody gets a little panicky about these WebExes is whenever we go live into it, but I'm just gonna crack my knuckles and go for it. Um, so here I am, I'm in Canvas. I've logged in as a course instructor. I can see that I'm in my course and I've got a lot of things I could do for my students here. I can go and add a new assignment for them. I can manage the discussion boards or the quizzes they're interacting with. Uh, Curriculum Builder can appear in two places, just like in Blackboard. Uh, Canvas can appear in two places in Canvas. It can either appear in the module section or it can appear as an assignment. So if faculty members wanted to quote, assign a reading list to their students. There is a way, I'm not going to demonstrate it in this WebEx, but there is a way to connect your curriculum builder into the assignments tab. What I'm going to do for this demonstration, though, is go through our modules. And you can kind of see on the screen here, let me make this a little bit bigger, that we've got a couple of different weeks. So I've structured my class to where every week they're going to come in and they're going to do the activities listed under the week here. I would like to add a reading list for week one. This is the part where if I didn't have Curriculum Builder, I'd have to go over to the library website and grapple with linking and downloading and all that stuff. But here we're going to eliminate it. What we've tried to design with Curriculum Builder is the path of least resistance for faculty members to use library materials. Because if we don't make it easier than downloading a PDF document out of the databases, then it's probably not going to get used much at all. So let's show you how it gets done. I want to add a new reading list for week one. Over here on the right hand side, I'm going to click on this plus symbol. And that plus symbol allows me to do things like add a new quiz or add a new assignment. But instead, I'm going to add a new external tool. What I get here is a list of the external tools that my campus administrator has set up for me. And you will find Curriculum Builder in this list. In this particular demonstration site, I've labeled it as OneSearch Reading List, and I'll go ahead and give that a click. This gives me a chance to rename this list, so I'm going to call it my WebEx Demo, Demo List, and I'll add an item. What you'll see is I've now got a new entry in week one that says WebEx Demo List. Whenever I give this a click, let me back out a little bit, you'll get Curriculum Builder here in the middle of the screen. So I want to go back and touch on a little bit. Remember those screens that I showed here 
uh, for Blackboard where I mentioned that under tools, you click on Curriculum Builder, it launches you into the Curriculum Builder experience. So if you were in Blackboard and you clicked on this item, or you were in Desire to Learn and you clicked on Reading List, or you were in Moodle and you clicked on Curriculum Builder, then you would end up at a screen like this, where you've got Blackboard wrapped around this same exact interface. So really, if you're asking the question, well, which part is Curriculum Builder and which part is Canvas, the stuff that's kind of inside this frame, to the right of all of these options and below this little header, this part on the inside of the frame here, that's Curriculum Builder, and it'll look exactly identical to what you're about to see in Blackboard, Moodle, and all of the other learning management systems. So at this point, I've created a new list. I can see that I'm working on my WebEx demo list here, and now I can do a search for something. Um, because it's raining outside, I'll go ahead and do weather forecasting and hit search. So it's important to know that whenever you search on Curriculum Builder here, it's actually hitting the exact same content that your, uh, that your faculty member would have found had they gone to your library's website. So I'm going to look through this list, same items here. I get some eBooks, I get the research starters. Uh, the research starters is a relatively new feature for Curriculum Builder that wasn't there uh, during the last release. And I can start adding some of these things for my students to read. So for example here, I'll go ahead and add that eBook to my reading list. Um, here's a journal article. I'm going to go ahead and add that one to my reading list, and I'll go ahead and add a few more. So at this point, I could be done. So if I'm a faculty member who wants my students to read some library materials on weather forecasting, all I would really have to do is create that new list, search for weather forecasting, and click on that button to add to reading list. I could move off and go grade some papers, go chat in the discussion board, or grab a margarita, or whatever it is I do after I build reading lists. But at this point, I'm done. However, there are a lot more things you can do with Curriculum Builder if you want to do a little digger, uh, a little bit more um, digging. So for example, on the left-hand side, in terms of finding materials, you can search and facet just like you can in EDS. Um, the features in EDS that have just been released, such as um, searching by citation, can be done here. You can punch in the title of something if you know exactly what you're looking for. Um, so in terms of searching, and the search experience, it's just as powerful as searching in EDS proper, um, except you've got this giant add to reading list button you can't really miss in the results set. So what I'm gonna do now though, is go up to this see current reading list tab up at the top. And whenever I click on this, I'm gonna have some options to be able to uh, work with my list here. So let's say I want this ebook second in my list. All I need to do is drag and drop it, and that will resort my list. I can also sort them by changing the sort order number, uh, but dragging and dropping works well too. Uh, I can delete items out of my reading list by clicking on this delete button. And I can annotate items too. So for example, for this particular journal article, I wanna say read the conclusions only or something like that. Read the discussion section only and then hit save notes. And those notes will be presented to my students whenever they go to actually do the reading of this particular item. I can also add things that are not in the library. So for example, if I want them to go to the National uh, Oceanic and Atmosphere, I'm gonna show my ignorance about remembering what the, uh, what the name of the governmental agency is, uh, but, oh, I'll just do weather.com. But if I want them to go to a website, I can punch in the link to the website here and I can label that link here and add that to my reading list. And it will go into my reading list just like every other reading that I've got. So here's the weather channel. I could add notes to it just like I added notes to a reading. And I can drag and drop it if I'd like to do that too. I can also add text and instructions. So for example here, read chapter five in textbook. Let's say the students also have, in addition to this digital reading, they've got reading that they need to do um, in their print textbook that they have for their course. So here you can see I've got um, a, you know, an entry for read chapter five in the textbook. I can add specific notes to this particular item if I wanted to. It doesn't link to anything, but it's here more as a reminder. We've seen some faculty members use this to warn students that there's a quiz on this stuff. Uh, so it has become a nice flexible way just to add notes to the reading list in general that's not associated with any particular reading. 
And if you have really big reading lists, you can also create folders. So I'll go ahead and create a folder for weather forecasting here. And what that will do is it'll create me a folder that I can now add items to. So for example, I can take this, uh, this, this particular article and drop it into my weather forecasting folder. And now what I have here is a folder that has one item in it. This is useful if your learning management system restricts how many external tools you can have. Uh, most of the major ones allow faculty members to create as many reading lists as they want. But I know, in, for example, in Sakai in particular, you can place this only one reading list in the entire course. Um, that's a limitation of Sakai. So what we've seen faculty members do who are working in that system is they will use it as their whole semester's reading list, but then organize their content by folders here. So it's a way that you can use this tool and organize the readings by week or by topic, even if you have a learning management system that only lets you create one reading list. Those are few and far between. The most common implementation is people can create as many reading lists as they'd like. Um, you can also, well, I, I think that's probably um, a good amount of features to show. What I want to show now is what the student experience is like. So I'm a faculty member. I've put together this effort at, at building this list. Now let's see what the students interact with. So if I go over to modules over here on the left-hand side, and there's my WebEx demo list. I'm going to publish it just so when I log in as a student, I can actually see it. Um, so now that it's published, um, I'm going to go to settings and let's switch over to student view. All right, here I am. I have just logged in my learning management system. I'm in my class as a student. Let's see if my faculty member has, my teacher has posted anything today. So I go to modules and I see, okay, this is new. There's a link that says WebEx demo list. I'm going to give that a click. Now, rather than getting a search box that I would use to search through the library, instead, I just get the list of readings associated with that particular link. I've got a link out to the Weather Channel, I've got the ebook down here, and I've got a PDF document, I've got a reminder to read Chapter 5, and there's a folder that has items here. Now, my main interest as a student is to get the reading done before class, so I'm likely going right for this full text link and giving it a click. What you'll notice is I can print, I can read online, I'm now good to go. So from a student's perspective, it doesn't do much at all, but it does the one thing I really needed to do very, very quickly, and that's provide access to these readings. I also want to point out that whenever I clicked on this full text, it registered a full text usage in EBSCO admin. So now you as a library are detecting that someone has read this particular item. So I can go into folders, I can do my readings here, but really there's not much else uh, that I would do as a student within, uh, within a reading list. I'm going to pop back out to the faculty member view. All right, so here I am, I'm back at this reading list, um, but now I'm logged into Canvas as a faculty member. One thing that I want to do is to know if my students did the reading or not. So I can come up here and click on See Current Reading List. I'm back to where I can organize my list, and I see right up here at the top, one student has accessed this list. And if I open it up, I see that a student with a very creative name, a test student, has accessed this particular list. As I go down, I can see that one student did click on this particular article, but if I go down further, I see that no students clicked on this particular reading. So I can get a reading by reading breakdown of which students have done the readings and which ones haven't. Um, I, I guess that, that's overstepping a little bit. I don't know if they actually did the reading or not. I do know that they clicked on this link. They could have very easily clicked on it and not read it at all, uh, but at least that detail on whether or not they clicked into that is possible. We did try some things on trying to see if they actually read the item, but in the end, uh, students could potentially print the item and then leave the page, so you can't even use time on page as an indicator of if they read or not because they could have just printed it out and read it that way. So. Uh, we're unable to really tell if they've done the reading. Um, that's really where your quizzing comes in. Um, but that's, in a nutshell, what Curriculum Builder 
is and does. Um, I want to show you a little bit about the reporting before I turn it over to Keith to talk about how this has gone over uh, at Pima Community College. So let's dig into some of the reporting that you'll get with Curriculum Builder. So I'm going to pull this over here. Um, and actually, while I've got a question that's come in, can the instructor add links to PowerPoint presentations, Word documents, notes, etc.? Um, one of the most frequent feature requests we get for Curriculum Builder is for faculty members to be able to upload their own content into Curriculum Builder. And while that's not possible today, it is our number one feature request. Um, the problem with that is once we do it, um, Curriculum Builder goes from just being a collection of links to a whole web server that has to store lots of content. But what they can do is if they've got a place to host it themselves, so they've got their own like Google Drive or something like that. They can share it from there and paste the URL using the Add Web Resource button. Let's see. Uh, if a professor assigned an ebook, would there be complications if it is a one copy, one user title? Uh, so in this particular case here, I've got an EBSCO ebook that I added. Let's see. I'm not sure if I've got this linked. Yep, I do have it linked up correctly. So I've got this reading here, and I'm now looking at the, the page here. Um, this will trigger a, a use of this particular ebook. So if you do have ebooks that are single user only, this student has got it. We are working on an enhancement to bring the concurrent usage uh, information right to the results list. That way, if a faculty member does find a book in Curriculum Builder that's single user, it's very apparent that it's single user. And if they do decide to add that to um, the Curriculum Builder reading list, students will also have an indication of why they were turned away if it's here. Um, however, uh, there is nothing that would prevent a faculty member from adding a one copy, one user title uh, to a reading list unless you curated what Curriculum Builder searches through. And I'm going to touch on, on that little nuance here in just a second. All right, so I'm going to pop back over to this screen. This is Curriculum Builder's administrative functions. Let me make this a bit bigger so we can read it together. Um, I've cleared out the top three. You, you probably don't want to mess with these top three items here, but what they do is they tell Curriculum Builder which EDS profile to use to populate the reading list. So in this way, for those of you who have EDS and you're familiar with it, you can create multiple EDSs, one for Curriculum Builder that has a subset of the materials that you want faculty members using. If you don't have EDS and you have EBSCOhost databases, this will also point us to where your EBSCOhost databases are and use that content in, in uh, Curriculum Builder. And I realize I should have said this from the outset, and I apologize for this. If you don't have EDS, you can still use Curriculum Builder. The only difference is the content that you find. So with EDS, you find everything um, that your library has. But if you don't have EDS, then you'll find everything that you get through your EBSCOhost databases. But in terms of look and feel and setup and functionality, it is identical regardless of whether or not you're an EDS customer. There is a section here on uh, learning management system roles that can edit lists. Typically, the only people that should be editing the lists are instructors and teaching assistants, but you can add other types of users to this list to change that. I'm only going to point out some of the impactful changes here. Um, so there's also things having to do with branding and adding up a logo, um, which we've done here, as well as contact information of who the faculty member should reach out to if there's trouble. But I want to pop down to the bottom to some of these options because it's important to realize um, some of the settings that you have. So for example, the collect student data option here I've set, uh, is set here to detailed. What Detail does is it will collect, as students use Curriculum Builder, who they are and which reading they did. This enables us to tell the faculty member who did what reading. So this is the only setting you can use if you want your faculty members to be able to tell who's done the reading and who hasn't. If you're not comfortable with that level of detail, you can switch to Anonymized. Anonymized will uh, remove their real names from the list but leave in that anonymized user ID that they have from Blackboard or Canvas or Moodle, but it is anonymized. You, we can't use that to show faculty member who's done the reading or not. Um, what we can do, though, is use anonymized data to provide the library 
with detailed information about how their collection is being used in the learning management system without giving away names. Finally, there's none. If you don't want us to collect any kind of student interaction in Curriculum Builder, you flip it to none and, and that happens. Um, we did a lot of work talking with librarians about how they felt about privacy when it comes to this, this particular feature. And what we, we found is, since we're not really collecting information about students doing independent research, we're just logging that they read the assigned reading, that that does not typically entail a breach of privacy. But that is up to your library to decide if you want to retain detailed information or some of these other settings. Um, let me show you what that does here. If I go to download student data up at the top, it gives me an Excel document. And I'm going to go ahead and pop this open. And what you see here is the name of student, where they came from, what reading they did, which course they were in, and which course number they were in. And if you have any kind of learning outcomes analytics that you're doing at your library, you could potentially use this to tie this to GPA data and other kind of, uh, kinds of uh, uh, learning analytics data. The download export file up here is slightly different. It will give you the list of readings that have been added to all reading lists within your learning management system. So this will give you a sense of which faculty members are using it and which courses are using it at a very, very granular level. I see Keith was busy early on, but then it looks like Rita has been doing some work in uh, Curriculum Builder as well. Um, and as I take a look through this list, there are a few more options to point out here. One, copy course support. So here, if I um, select yes, that means as courses get copied forward every semester, the reading list stick around. This is the one that's probably most important here, though. Hide, full text, and available in library collection limiters. What these will do is not give faculty members any way to see content outside the library's collection. And that's important for a reading list tool because you may not want faculty members to be adding things that every student's going to need to interlibrary loan to get a hold of. So if you choose yes here, they will have no option to remove those limiters and they will be limited to only those things that your library subscribes to. If you select no here, just be prepared that some faculty members may uncheck the full text limiter and then start adding things to the reading list that they actually should request from the library because it's not a part of your collection. Um, there are some other items here, but the final thing I wanted to show before I turn it over to Keith is a bit more detail about this. So here I can see how many people are using the tool and I get the list of faculty members and, and other people who have created lists. Oh my goodness, uh, Dr. Schmidt has 191 lists here. We also have a bunch of courses. So from a library perspective, you can tell where these, uh, these reading lists are and how many courses are using the tool. So it's a nice tool to use to get your head wrapped around how a curriculum builder is being used um, at your institution. So with that kind of in mind, uh, kind of leaning, moving forward to assessing and talking about curriculum builder, from a librarian's perspective and a campus perspective, uh, I'm going to turn the presentation reins uh, over to Keith. And I'll pull up your slides, Keith, and you can introduce yourself uh, and tell me to advance whenever you'd like. OK, thank you so much, Eric. Can you hear me well, I hope? Yeah, you're coming through great. Excellent. So my name is Keith Rocky. I'm the library director of the community campus. That's our online college um, where uh, we're a, a six six campus system so there are six library directors of, of the various campuses and I take care of all the online courses and um, um, when we looked at this I was teaching a class in the spring of 2015 because I teach uh, as part of my position and um, I was so sick of, of, of the links not working and, and students complaining in the fall that I had heard of this I, I think it was Kunstown University had a video out there on YouTube and I watched it and I was like and we're a D2L school desire to learn Brightspace and I was like this is exactly what I want and um, so we convinced um, I think Joel Pratt was our rep at the time if we could just try it and so I used it in my class and it was seamless so um, it opened a, a lot of doors for me that first semester and then we bought it it was a nominal fee 
and we had, um, you can go ahead and advance to the next slide. So in the fall of 2015, so a year and a half ago, um, we had like a soft opening. I created a bunch of pathfinders for courses um, based on the course learning outcomes. So I would go through the, the system and um, try to find things that I thought instructors would use. I'm embedded in 53 writing classes right now, and we have a faculty member who loves Robert Frost, like loves him. So I created an, an immense intensive pathfinder using the curriculum builder for this faculty member, and he was able to edit it and delete it and kind of cater it to his students. Um, we didn't have a lot of use that first year. But now um, we have 19 faculty members with three librarians that use it in all of their classes. And a full-time load at Pima is five classes in the fall and five classes in the spring. And they're able to copy those lists from class to class. Um, I think it spread um, because we talked about it. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about marketing. Um, we have four faculty members that actually use it to link to an ebook that has an unlimited license. And basically that eliminated the print textbook or the paid textbook for the class because the library buys the ebook license, right? So then it's unlimited and then the students use it and they have the book on the first day of class. So it's kind of a local resource. Um, that really has turned into like the mission of, 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 of what I do now is I'm in EBSCO ebooks looking for unlimited books. Um, that that work well with the content. So you can go to the next slide. So here's how our faculty have used it, and this probably crosses over into all course management systems. Um, discussions, uh, I've seen that used quite a bit where they'll link to just one article or one resource and they'll make that the prompt um, for the discussion so the student can go there and read it and obviously they have a post first feature on that where a student can't see what other people post, other students post. I've seen that used quite a bit. Um, the D2L quizzes, you can um, have them read something. Um, we're an EDS school so that those resources seem to be um, what we've been using. Um, and um, so they can find something. They usually find it outside of the the LTI interface or the, the the curriculum builder interface in the learning management system. So they come to me and they're like, hey, I like this in my class. I want to make a quiz. I've, I've written the questions already. So they make the quiz and then we have the student do the read the resource and we link right to it. Um, textbook adoption. Um, we're up to four right now. Four faculty have ditched their textbooks and are using our ebooks as the curriculum for the course. So our library uh, statistics are going way up. The last way is like the old Pathfinder, right? So um, my wife is, is from Switzerland, so I made a bunch of European Pathfinders for our, some of our history classes, and I started with Switzerland because I knew that, and then I moved to Italy, and I did a couple other countries just using our resources, and um, those seem to be getting used because they're embedded in classes. So um, it, it's it's not much different than the way we did it 30 years ago when I was at the University of Arizona, it's like a course reader I pick up at Kinko's, right, and has all this information in there, but now it's being created in a, in a virtual way where the resources are being used and I can track them through uh, the recording. So you can go to the next slide if you don't mind. So um, I work with a lot of faculty one-on-one -on -one and um, that is where I would be talking to them about, because well, I'm embedded in their classes, so I'm like, hey, you have this resource. Have you thought about looking at what the library has to offer? Um, and then we would go through, we would use Megasearch or something, and I'd be like, well, what about this? In the fall, for one of our reading classes, because it was an election year, um, we embedded some really cool things on both sides of the aisle, I might add, and it was kind of cool, has, uh, as the student went through each week in the 16 weeks, and they linked to two resources every week that were uh, relative and, and on point to what was going on in, in the current affairs. Um, probably the one thing I'm doing right now is, because I'm part of the OER initiative, is looking at library resources and how the library resources compare to the course learning outcomes. Now, we integrated all those OpenStax books, if you're familiar with OpenStax, through the Hewitt Foundation and Rice University into our catalog. So we have a lot of those, but I was thinking, hey, we spend a lot of money on these resources. How can we make them, you know, uh, it's the carrot or the stick, right? So we make it part of the class, they gotta use it. 
So we've seen that as being kind of a trend that, you know, I go to a class and, and I go look at a class online, I see the textbook, I'm like, hey, is there something else that we might have that might meet those needs? And uh, more likely than not, uh, you'd be surprised. There's a lot of information out there in um, our EBSCO package that, that we use and have been able to. Uh, now, Pearson and McGraw-Hill and Kendall Hunt and all those people, they're not real happy about it. But our students are because then there's no textbook involved. Um, um, there's still a textbook of sorts, but it's a virtual one. And students can obviously go back and buy a, a, a print ebook if they really want one through a, a number of resources. Um, I like the idea of building the reading list based on current events. I did that a few times, um, and um, that was that was probably the that was fun actually. You know, I really liked that because it kept me informed, especially with fake news. You know, I was doing a lot with fake news, so um, we used the global news item in in D2L to kind of announce the um, the plugin, and that seemed to work. So everybody. Everybody got the information um, about it, and then they were given me as a resource. So um, we have about um, we have 19, 19 users right now that are using it pretty frequently. It is part of our faculty orientation, and this is like we've had it like a little more than a year and a half. So um, in the fall, we're going to show it to all the new faculty. We get about twenty each semester or each fall. It's part of our faculty learning academy. So we're going to show it to them to help um, create some some resources for them. So a couple things. Um, I don't know if you um, got a copy of the um, the article that was written online, but it shows my three takeaways and the reason that I'm an advocate for this. Well, first of all, it's made me super relevant um, with faculty because they're contacting me and saying, "Hey, can you help me find resources for my class?" and uh, uh, Usually I have to go hunt them down and ask them because I'm, you know, I'm a librarian, I'm support faculty. I'm faculty, but I'm educational support faculty. So there were really three takeaways, you know. Um, we're leveraging library resources at a higher volume than we ever have, even in these classes we're working in now. We're getting a lot of hits with inside our LMS that we didn't have before, and we're able to um, to articulate that in my year-end report, and that's really cool. Um, the the second takeaway is we're saving students money. I mean, I don't know, I have a kid in college and those textbooks are ridiculously expensive and he didn't even use one for his class that he had um, last summer and it was $182 and he didn't even have to open it. So um, if we can, those of you that have children in college or you will have children in college, textbooks are expensive. So if we can kind of um, save them money and if they have the resources on the first day of a class, I think that is so important at improving their odds of success because we do know that there's research that shows if you have a textbook early in the class you're going to do well that's pretty logical the the um the final area and and i've i've talked to ebsco many times about this is they're willing to um kind of help us figure out how we're using it and how we can use it more effectively um if, if, if the interface now i tend to find the materials in our like our mega search in our databases, and then I build it so I know exactly the six or seven articles that I need. Um, so there, um, it's really helping um, our students become better consumers of information because we, I mean, we use a lot of scholarly and popular sources um, in there, and and we have a database called Flipster that isn't yet speaking to Curriculum Builder, but I've been told by several people that it will in the future. And we do. We sixty percent of our students um, uh, need remediation and are in some kind of developmental ed program course or whatever. So we want them to read. And uh, guess what? That uh, Flipster has a lot of magazines that they will read. So we're hoping that um, that that will change our reading courses. We use our course management system, Desire to Learn, Brightspace, in every one of our classes, whether it's online or in person. So um, that that is a plus. So. Um, I think I'm within my time. Um, you can go to the next slide. So there's my uh, my information. And if you're considering this um, and you have questions, I can tell you everything um, how we did it. You know, and, and it might it might help you. It's really uh, for me. It's turned out to be such a blessing because again, it's uh, it's uh, faculty see me as being a very positive resource. We have do have fa faculty that 
build their list on their own. Actually, one of the faculty in that list never came to me. She figured it out on her own. She's like this junior techno whiz faculty member, and um, she uses it in all of her classes, and she doesn't have any textbooks at all. She uses all library resources in her class. So um, I think I'm, I'm within my time, uh, Eric. Uh, I yeah. don't have any. I see a question about um, um, if there's a way they can have access to this presentation afterwards, and I believe it's being recorded because I see recording on the bottom. Yep, that's right. So we will send a link out to this um, WebEx so you can share with any other stakeholders that you have. There are a couple of things, Keith, that you brought up that um, might be really interesting to hear about. So one thing that that you all, I think, were one of the first that we saw happen is get rid of the textbook and leverage ebooks in in lieu of that. And you mentioned that you go out and you find those unlimited ebooks that. Uh, students could use as a textbook. Uh, one other thing that we're doing with the EDS index is finding open educational resources now, things that we didn't have a year ago that we do now. So, for example, um, the SUNY Open Textbook Project, a uh, huge uh, you know, selection of, of books that were written as textbooks for courses that were made open. So these OER types of resources are now being indexed in EDS. So what that means is if you have that combo of EDS and Curriculum Builder, all those open textbooks are now discoverable through that particular, uh, through Curriculum Builder. So it could be something new uh, for the, the Pima Community College and any other libraries that have Curriculum Builder to start checking out and seeing how the SUNY open textbooks uh, work within this system. Um, our goal is always to try to find more materials that, that faculty members can use. Uh, in their courses, and these OER, uh, Open Educational Resources, is a good source for that kind of stuff. Um, I got a question on, am I correct in understanding that instead of emailing lists of articles to instructors uh, for curriculum development, I can instead send them a list through Curriculum Builder, and they could edit that list and then post directly. Um, that is true. Um, so the way that you would do that is in Curriculum Builder, there's a way to copy an existing list. So you as a librarian would log in and build this list for them and then have your faculty members go and copy that list into their course. If you happen to be a teaching assistant or have a librarian role in that course, you could also just create the list directly there in the course. But that does allow the faculty member to go in, and as Keith mentioned in some of the examples, to edit that list, to remove items, to add items, and build it dynamically. And, and that's really what I do. Uh, actually, in the time that I've sitting here, I've gotten an email with, with a question for resources. And usually it's easier because every one of our classes has a D2L shell. It's easier for me to put it in there and kind of expose them to the, to the plugin in the tool. Um, we use the LTI protocol through our external learning tool, so it's super easy to use. And um, it, it, it keeps me busy, that's for sure. I think we see faculty members interacting with this tool on a range. So sometimes they want the librarian to come in and build them a list that they can use. Other times, you never even know that they're using it until you look at the statistics. Um, so it, it does kind of span um, the way that your library wants to work with faculty. There's a route for curriculum builder to, do, to go that route. Um, Keith, thank you for your time. We've got about 10 minutes left if people have questions about the tool, um, while uh, feel free to go ahead and pop them in the chat or the Q&A. Um, while you're doing that, I wanted to point out a couple of more features of the tool. One is authentication. During the live demo, I forgot to mention, when I clicked on that PDF link, you didn't see me log in. And that's because anything that comes out of your EBSCOhost databases, we bypass any additional authentication. So as long as they logged into their learning management system, that's good enough for us. We're going to show them those documents that come out of the EBSCOhost databases. So for those of you that use Curriculum Builder with EBSCOhost, uh, that means all of those items will not require a login. Um, if you use EDS with Curriculum Builder, that means on occasion you will see links that jump out to JSTOR or ScienceDirect or jump over to ProQuest. In those particular instances, we will pass the user through whatever authentication system your library uses. 
Now, if your users log into library resources through the exact same system they use to log into Canvas, they won't actually be presented for a second login because it'll remember that they logged in when they logged into Canvas. However, if you use separate systems, like you use Easy Proxy for library resources, but a different single sign-on for, uh, for your, your learning management system, that's the scenario where if you have a JSTOR item or a Science Direct item in that reading list, you will be prompted for that Easy Proxy login if you're off campus the first time you try to go through one of those links. Uh, Easy Proxy should remember you after that. Um, we're seeing, though, that less and less, um, uh, you know, more and more libraries are, are using the same authentication system for both the learning management system as well as their library resources. Uh, so it's becoming less of an issue. All right. Hey, Eric. Uh -huh, go for it. Um, someone had a question because they, uh, they didn't hear my response. Uh, I'm not sure if, if everyone's familiar with Flipster. Um, Flipster is amazing. It's, it's a, a magazine um, database, and it, it, it's wonderful. But, and, and someone asked, it's not talking with that resource yet, but there is plans future in the future to have that speaking to Curriculum Builder as well. Yes. Uh, we've got some new features uh, coming out, not only for Curriculum Builder, but for all of EDS that enable linking between uh, a list of results, and if you have that item in one of your Flipster subscriptions, linking right into that Flipster reading platform. Uh, so that is out for EDS, I think, now. It just got released last week, and we'll be in Curriculum Builder uh, soon after that. I had another Q&A here. Uh, will the faculty member actually see the real name of the student? Because all we saw in my demo was test student. Yes, they will see a list of Johnny Appleseed. Uh, you know, the, all the names of, of them will be there if you have selected the detailed version of collect student data. Um, let me scroll through here a little bit more. Go. Has it been tested with LCMS? I'm not sure what LCMS is. Uh, so Natalie, if you would post in, I, I'm, I'm going to guess um, that that is either a learning management system or an accessibility tool. One thing that I'd like to point out is we've had some faculty members with either dexterity or vision impairments that prevent them from using uh, some library resources. We've gotten feedback from those same faculty members as they build lists that Curriculum Builder was actually a lot easier to navigate with the assistive technology that they have than even their other library resources. So in terms of compliance, um, not only do we comply, but we've tried to make Curriculum Builder very easy for people um, who use assistive technologies to navigate the system. Um, we can also provide what's called a VPAT. Uh, I think that's the formal documentation that's often needed by, uh, by uh, accrediting agencies to know if something is, is uh, com uh, compliant or not. Uh, is Curriculum Builder relying on library subscription to EDS? Uh, nope, it is not. You can have just EBSCO content in there. Uh, can Curriculum Bil Builder be used with Ex Libris, Ex Libris Primo? Uh, currently, it only works with the EBSCO Discovery Service Index, but you can include your EBSCO host databases in Curriculum Builder if you go that route. Uh, so, for example, um, if you're a Primo uh, user, but you have Academic Search and Business Source and other EBSCO databases, for a faculty member who launches Curriculum Builder in that type of environment, the only content they're going to find in Curriculum Builder will be the EBSCO ones. Um, if you have EDS, we use that index to pull in your library's collections. Um, let's see, I think that answers several of the questions that were here. Um, authentication, yep, we answered. Um, let's see, and we answered about linking out to non-EBSCO content. Um, there he is. So correct, uh, the clarification bit here, if you don't have EDS, you will only see results out of your EBSCOhost databases that you subscribe to, um, not the entirety of the library's holdings. Um, will the number of full text downloads be tied into our normal statistics so we can look at it in our databases? So an EBSCO admin, 
curriculum builder appears as its own profile. So if you are on, um, if you are in EBSCO admin, you go to reports and statistics, uh, and you do whatever reporting you do, um, the profile labeled curriculum builder will be the one that describes full text downloads, searches, session time, kind of all the stuff that you're used to seeing from your EBSCO databases, you'll get uh, from curriculum builder separately. You can then combine them if you'd like, um, but uh, they will be pulled out so you can evaluate Curriculum Builder on its own. Um, let's see, let's see. Uh, will the open textbook stuff work if you don't have EDS? Um, that is correct. It, it will only work if you have EDS. That's where we've indexed the SUNY uh, open textbook content there. Um, there are other open educational resources that are in EDS, including Archive and Oyster, and a number of other things, and we continue to try to get more open content, but that is going into the EDS index. So if you're not using EDS, uh, then you likely won't have that content in your curriculum builder. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, I, this is great clarification from Barb. Um, if you use EDS, you can still get your EBSCO eBooks as well as your EBSCO databases. Uh, so not just, uh, not just the article content, but you will get your EBSCO eBooks there, uh, just not any non-EBSCO eBooks. Um, EDS is really the piece that opens it up to the rest of your library's collections. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, ah, thanks, Natalie. Med Medical School LMS. I don't know, um, but I can, let's see, in fact, this is probably a great way for other people to kind of see uh, if their learning management system is uh, compatible or not. So let's actually take a quick look. Uh, I've gotten some Google flu here, and shoot, now I've missed, I think it was LCMS, LCMS. Uh, let's try something. LCMS, uh, learning, I'm going to see if I can find the thing first. Mind flash looks like LCMS, and then I will do LTI. Uh, LCMS plus looks like it is good. Um, here we go. LCMS plus. Uh, this uh, it's good that we're seeing a site like this because IMS Global is a consortium of learning organizations that make the LTI protocol. So if we're seeing LCMS on this site and it is certified as IMS compliant, then that means LTI, up oh, there it goes, standards, LTI. So the answer, Natalie, is yes. Um, your learning management system will work just fine with Curriculum Builder. For others that don't know if theirs works or not, if you find anything on this IMS global site uh, with your learning management system, uh, then the likelihood is yes, it'll work just fine. Um, Let's see. Can you include a link to a video from a library catalog via EDS? Yes, you can. Um, uh, Keith mentioned that in his uh, run through was that, um, you know, that Films on Demand is included in either via your catalog or through the Films on Demand uh, database in EDS. Um, so you can include videos in EDS. And that, actually, I find a lot of libraries use it to build lists of videos. Uh, again, that is an EDS version of it. Um, there is a question on expired content that I do want to address. If your library stops subscribing to something or, uh, you know, as you know, aggregators uh, sometimes lose content and gain content over time, if there happens to be an item that your library no longer has access to, either because you have unsubscribed to something or it has rolled out of an aggregator of sorts, then what appears in Curriculum Builder is a placeholder. That placeholder says, it looks like this item may no longer be available through your library. Please contact your librarian for assistance. And both the faculty members and students who come across that list will see that item. Hopefully, though, the export that you get out of uh, Curriculum Builder will give you a list of items, and it'll give you a route to proactively reach out to faculty members who have reading list items that come from those things that you choose not to re-up for. Um, so you can do some proactive reaching out uh, based on the reading list that uh, reports that come out of Curriculum Builder. But even if things fall through the cracks, 
um, it won't be directing users to a paywall or to a broken page. Uh, it should at least give a user-friendly message saying that an item is no longer uh, no longer there. Um, let's see. Um, advantages over Aries and other um, course reserve type of stuff. I don't know Aries well enough to make a good comparison, but I have known a lot of libraries that use them in tandem with Aries. Um, it doesn't manage uh, licensing. It basically goes straight for what's in your library collection now, and it does provide that independence of faculty members being able to curate their own list on their own time uh, when they are building their curriculum in their course. Um, so I'm not exactly sure. Um, uh, I don't know Aries well enough to, to know what else it might do that Curriculum Builder doesn't. So in terms of next steps of what to do if you're interested in either getting a one-on-one -on -one demo or getting a quote for this item, uh, the best choice is just to reach out to your local EBSCO representative. Um, you can also email us at um, support at ebscohost.com and request uh, uh, some help. We also offer trials of Curriculum Builder. So if you've got some doubt as to whether or not your, uh, your LMS administrators are going to let you <laughs> work with Curriculum Builder in the course, a trial might be a good way to do it. Um, the trials uh, of Curriculum Builder don't have your library's content in it. Instead, it just has one database. Uh, I think it's Library and Information Services and Technology Abstracts or something like that. So there's not a lot of content in it when you get a trial. But what it will do is allow your learning management system administrators to fully implement that trial so you can tell for certain whether or not it's going to work fine in your learning management system. That's really what the trials are for, is to make sure you don't buy something and then get surprised when uh, your IT staff say it won't work or they say uh, they're not going to install it in their learning management system. So if you do have some hesitation on whether or not your IT staff can or will implement it, a trial might be a right route to go. Um, I will say that a lot of IT staff members' um, worries about library integration are actually overcome by dropping the acronym LTI. Uh, I've been surprised how many doors that have opened. So just like you would say mark to a librarian, and we get an idea of that type of data that you're talking about when you say MARC. Um, IT staff members often know exactly how it's going to plug into their system if you say LTI. Um, and I think that that opens a lot of doors um, because they likely have worked with LTI tools in the past. Um, so it is 2 o'clock uh, Eastern time. Um, I do appreciate everyone's time. Uh, if you have any follow-up questions, do not hesitate to reach out to your uh, local EBSCO contact, and we'd be happy to, um, to answer any more questions you might have. Uh, again, thank you so much for your time today and in coming to this session. Thank Thanks you so Steve. much. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, thank you, man. I appreciate uh, having you on. It was fun. Have a great day. Thanks, Rachel.